Yeah, I'll, um, I'll do pH real quick and then we can just review a little bit, get you on the right, all on the same page so you're all ready for the lab on Tuesday. Like some, I forgot who it was. Somebody said it has to do with hydrogen concentration. Um, so pH, and there are different ways to, to think about pH, just as there's different ways to think about a variety of things. But for simplicity, we're going to say minus log hydrogen ion concentration. And like I mentioned, H pluses don't really exist as independent H pluses. They become hydronium ions. And even there, there's different versions of those. But for kind of the quick and dirty chemistry that we need to do for this class, there are H pluses, let them exist. Um, and then, yeah, and I should mention, whenever we have those brackets, brackets just mean kind of the molar concentration of whatever is in the brackets. You know, later on, we'll be talking about you know, concentration of sodium or concentration of potassium ions or whatever. Um, whenever we do something in these little brackets, it just means the molar concentration of that particular thing in the solution. So minus log, um, in fact, let's first talk. If we have water, water is, a molecule and we said molecules are vibrating and twisting and every once in a while even if you have a glass of just pure distilled water every once in a while thanks to all this shaking and bumping in the stuff one of them will break apart Oop, too big sometimes it'll break apart into like an h plus and an oh minus you know and at the same time if there is an OH plus, you know, an OH minus and an H plus, and they bang into each other just the right way, they might reform and just become a water again. So you basically have this kind of equilibrium. You've got water molecules busting apart into H pluses, H pluses regrouping with the OH minuses to become water again. Um, you know, this is an equilibrium. Almost everything we're gonna look at in this class is gonna be in a chemical equilibrium where things, reactants go to products, but then periodics go back to be the reactants depending on the conditions. And there's some balance there. Um, in just distilled water, very little H plus exists as free H plus at any moment. Most of it's just water molecules. So like in this DH2O, which means distilled water, the concentration of the H plus is going to be about 10 to the minus seventh. Um, again, 10 to the minus seventh. That's one over 10 million, right? It's, it's a very small little, but one ten millionth. Um, if I want to find the pH of that, then I have to use my little formula. Um, what does log mean? What is the definition of log in math? It's like tenfold. It's related to 10. It's like 10 times what you're talking about? Not quite. No. Then you would just say multiply times 10. That would be, it'd be simpler ways. So it's the power, the exponent that you have to raise 10 to, to give you the number. So basically 10 to the log X equals X. So whatever power you have to put here, 10 to the what gives you X, that number is the log of X. Um, so if we take that idea here, what is the log of 10 to the minus seventh? What power, again, this is gonna sound like a trick question and it's not. What power do you, 
Yeah, it's negative my, seven. Exactly, it's negative seven. So log of 10 to the minus seventh is just seven because the 10 to the, I mean, no, to the negative 10 to the negative seven gives you 10 to the negative seven, duh. So, and then pH, we have to um, change the sign. So pH is going to be seven, which is basically minus log of H plus. So that's when we talk about pH of neutral water being seven, it just means that the concentration of hydrogen ions is 10 to the minus seventh in there due to this, you know, spontaneous, sometimes they break apart, but then more often, most of it stays as water. So very low. Um, so this is where the, the ups and downs get weird. So let's say I have a thousand times higher concentration of H plus. So for instance, um, HCl, hydrochloric acid, goes in, dissociates. This is a strong acid. This is because it all dissociates. It adds lots of H pluses. So now, in addition to the original H pluses that I have in the water, I've got a whole bunch more that have been donated by the HCl. So let's say my H plus is now, if it was 10 to the minus seventh. Um, if I wanna be a thousand times higher, it would be like 10 to the minus fourth, right? 10 to the minus fourth is only one 10,000th instead of one 10 millionth. This is a thousand, thousand times higher than 10 to the minus seventh, right? So this is thousand times more H pluses. And if I just plug it into the pH equation, minus log 10 to the minus fourth is four. So here we can see that a couple of things that are important. One is when hydrogen ion concentration is going up, the pH number is going down. So that's important. This in this week we say this is more acidic. Um, the other thing is this log is works on exponents rather than a linear scale. So every time you have a pH number change by one, the concentration is actually changing by ten. So pH seven is neutral water, 10 times as much H plus would be six, 100 times as much would be five. Here we see a thousand times as much would be four pH. If I had a million times, it would just mean like, you know, pH of one, right? Because each number we go down is actually 10 times more H plus. 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million. So it's a very nonlinear scale. You know, and then the pH will go up if you have less H pluses, right? So if I take like a strong base, say like sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide goes into the and this is basically dissociates completely Na plus plus OH minus. Now I have lots more OH minuses floating around. Those OH minuses are going to get together with H pluses and take them out of the solution. So now, whereas I had 10 to the minus seventh as my H plus concentration, let's say I have a thousand times less now. A thousand times less would be like 10 to the minus 10th. Right, that's 1,000 times smaller than 10 to the minus seventh. And we plug it into our pH equation again. It's 10. So the pH number goes up 
when the concentration of the hydrogen is getting smaller. This is what we call more alkaline or more basic. So, I promise you there will be question, a question or two on your quiz and your exam on pH, because pH is important and it gets confusing. So make sure you get this idea of you know, pH, you know, seven in the middle. If it's becoming, if the number is becoming less, or low, I should say lower pH, that actually means increase in hydrogen ion concentration, you know, more acidic. If the pH is getting higher, this is actually meaning um, decrease in H plus concentration and more alkaline, you know, less acidic more basic. So just, you want to keep this straight because people get confused. I get confused sometimes when I'm like thinking about it too fast. pH goes down, H plus goes up. pH goes up, H plus goes down. More acidic means lower pH number. So You know, I'm trying to do like, huh? You know, so spend a little bit of time trying to figure, trying to like get it, make sure it's all clear because you don't want to lose points on an exam because you're getting like flustered or confused by this stuff. And it does, it does matter. It's important to understand or to have a good intuition for what pH is and what it means. Um, any questions about that? Right, and so like I said, pH is gonna be critical to control homeostasis for because most of your enzymes have a very narrow range that they're gonna function in properly. You have all sorts of ways to try to keep pH stable. Um, the lab that we're gonna be doing is going to look specifically at pH, you know, pH buffers. The idea of a pH buffer is doing something so that if you added a strong base or a strong acid, that the overall pH would not change so dramatically. You know, so in our lab, the first part of the lab is you're actually going to be taking distilled water. You're going to be taking a buffer. And in both cases, you're going to have a pH meter, something that actually will measure the pH. And you're going to just add drops of acid, drops of base, and see how the pH changes as you add acid or base to distilled water versus doing the same thing to a buffer. We're gonna use a buffer that's similar to the ones that we find in the cells. Um, so that's gonna be the first part. A pH buffer, all it means is something that resists changes in pH, helps pre preserve homeostasis of pH. Because like I was showing here, if you add a strong acid, it adds in these H pluses and the pH goes down. You know, if you add a strong base, these hydroxyls will sequester the H pluses. So H plus goes down and the pH goes up. So a buffer is something that's going to stop that from happening and keep the pH relatively stable, even though you're adding the acids and the bases. Um, I'll briefly just mention how they work and then we'll stop talking about it. So for instance, let's, okay, let's look at carbonic acid. So 
So weak acid, H2CO3 is carbonic acid. It dissociates reversibly into H plus plus HCO3 minus. This is just a, this is a, a polyatomic ion. This is bicarbonate ion. So weak acid means that it does not completely dissociate. So lots intact. Some is dissociated. So I'm in some equilibrium where I've got some of the H2CO3 is just an intact molecule in the water. Some of it has split apart to become H plus plus HCO3 minus the bicarbonate ion. This is going to be the core of the buffer. And it's because this equilibrium can shift depending on what happens to the products or the reactants. If I add a strong acid, if I, let's say I add HCl and I've got a bunch of extra H pluses around, that I didn't have before, those are gonna push, they'll start grabbing onto these and it's gonna push the equilibrium this way. I'm gonna have more intact H2CO3 and these H pluses will have gotten sequestered into these little carbonic acid molecules. So even though I added H pluses, they're kind of effectively being removed from the solution. Um, if I add a strong base, like let's say I added NaOH, so I had lots more OHs around, which are then connecting up and taking the H pluses out, that is going to shift the equilibrium this way more of this is going to dissociate and add more H pluses back into the solution. So whatever I do, if I take away H pluses, more of this will dissociate and my equilibrium shifts that way and I add them back in. If I am adding in more H pluses, then the equilibrium will shift this way and those H pluses will be removed and just turned into this H plus, I mean H plus, H2CO3. So again, you don't have to, you know, you're not going to get tested on the detail detail and what are the conjugate bases and blah, blah, blah. But you, I think that you can get kind of an intuitive sense of why this works. This is with carbonic acid. We're going to use a phosphate buffer, which is basically the same basic idea. Um, this carbonic acid buffer is what keeps your plasma, um, keeps your plasma basically stable. So are there questions about pH? I know I just kind of threw a bunch of stuff at you, but I realize that's going to save us some time next time. No questions? That's awesome. It's awesome. Either either it's awesome people get it, or awesome, or actually scary that people just are lost and don't want to ask. Um, all right. So the chemistry review lab. You know, when we come in on Tuesday, we'll start with just by doing lecture in class, and then we'll take a break, and then we're going to start this lab. And again, the first part is going to be this buffer systems. And again, you can read, you've already read this a bit. You know, I would recommend when you are doing your um, lab notebook, keep the different sections, um, parts of the lab kind of independent. Um, you know, don't cut out all of the, I wish I wanna look at the, I'm changing my view completely. Page display, enable scrolling. Oh, here it is. Um, wait. Back. I am, where's my view?
All right. You know, part one, I would like cut out the instructions for part one and paste them before you start getting the data for part one. You know, so, and then, you know, so you could basically have, it's gonna be methods, which are gonna be that. And then you're gonna actually be writing your data in your lab notebook um, and following this. And then you can cut out the instructions for part two and include those and write down your data for there. And then finally, you know, for part three. And then after all of that is done, you'll then be able to kind of do more of a broader conclusion and kind of tie everything together. But in, in order to keep things kind of organized, it's probably going to make sense to, um, to do it kind of more or, yeah, organized like that. Um, you know, so like in your lab notebook. And so make sure the things you're going to need on Tuesday, you're going to need your lab notebook. You're going to need the lab manual sections. in order to cut and paste and put it in there. Um, make sure that your lab notebook has the table of contents on page one. Right, this lab, this first lab should not start on page one. It should start like on page three because page one is your table of contents. You know, and then the basic idea is it's going to be kind of methods. This is just going to be cut and paste. And there's going to be data. These are basically your observations as you do the, do the lab. Um, you know, this should be, you know, as you see it. You know, sometimes if you're the one who's adding the little drops of acid and checking things out, it might be one of your lab mates is actually recording the values and you're going to have to copy them from her or him after you're done if you're the actual active person. Um, but in general, you want to make sure that you gather the data as it's happening. Or if you're describing what happens when you mix something and don't try to do it all and then remember and reconstruct it in your brain after. Try to describe things as you see them. So directly in lab book. You know, no scratch paper. You know, which means it might be worth spending a little bit of time, maybe making a little chart before, like if you're gonna do the thing with the pH. You know, you might have like, you know, so this is for distilled water and this is like drops of acid. You know, and this is pH, whoops. You know, so zero and what was it? Let's say it was 7.2 or whatever. But let's say we don't even know yet. One, two, three, four, five. We have five drops of acid. And then we have drops of base, which is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so it probably makes sense to have some kind of nice. This one isn't as pretty. It's probably more like that. Oh, that, this okay. I'm making I'm making it prettier. Is what I'm doing right now. You know, so basically I have this thing ready to go and it's gonna be prettier than mine because it's, you've got the graph paper in there. So now as somebody is recording the data, again, if they record zero drop before we do anything, let's say it's 7.4, they add a drop, it's down to six point, I don't know, uh, they add two, maybe it's down to 3.25, but you have a place to just record the data as you're getting it. Um, that way things stay a little more organized. 
So it usually is, there's, there's not like the one way to, to do this, but there are better or worse ways to try to make your lab book stay relatively organized. So you actually, if you just record random numbers, chicken scratch everywhere, it's gonna be really hard to know what is going on. Um, and then what we'll also do after you record all of your data, you know, cause like I talked about the randomness, the randomness and the sources of variability and all of that, usually you don't ever trust one experiment or one set of data to be telling you the truth about the world. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have everybody take their data and type it into a common Excel spreadsheet on a computer that we have in the classroom. And that's something that we can then share with everybody as well. And uh, so you can see how much your personal um, results um, agree with the overall trends that people saw in the class. You know, so, but that's what this is gonna be like. We'll have record the data um, directly in there. Again, it often makes sense to make a little table or something if it's appropriate, you know, and then your discussion is gonna be important. I'll talk more about this in, in the class on Tuesday, but the basic idea is following some instructions and getting the data. You know, it's important to be able to do it, but it's not the whole point. The whole point isn't, can you follow instructions? The whole point is, can you see the deeper connections about what these results actually mean? So this discussion is gonna be your kind of synthesis of what you found and how it relates to the concepts that we're looking at and why, how they connect together and why it all makes sense. And again, it's gonna be the stuff we've been talking about. And I'll do my best to actually in like the little post lab kind of bring home some of the main points that you should definitely uh, fold into your discussion. Um, it has to be in pen. So you need a lab notebook, the lab manual section, you need a pen, probably scissors and adhesive of some sort to actually paste the methods in. Um, again, we've, yeah, at this point, if, if you're reading over the procedure, it should all look pretty, familiar to you now. It should all, it should not look as mysterious as it did when you read it before our class started today. So when we come in on Tuesday, you'll have a pretty good sense of what are we going to be doing and also why, what, what we expect to find and why that makes sense. But there is no formal pre-lab. You don't have to write anything up ahead of time. You just have to make sure you arrive on Tuesday kind of with your kind of head wrapped around what we're doing. Um, all right, any questions, comments, or otherwise? I have a question. Uh-huh. Are we gonna have the same lab partner each day, each time we go in or not? Um, typically it's up to you. I usually don't control that. Um, although sometimes it's fun to mix it up just so people get to meet new people or if, if weird dynamics start, um, arising. Um, but in general, I kind of figure people can just, you know, pick people they like to work with. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, oh, the other thing I will mention, I forgot to mention, um, in general, we, we're going to have a warm up quiz. So it'll be very, very short. It's worth one point. So and you're supposed to have it done before class starts. So it's, it'll be like a few questions, each question worth like literally 0. 0.2 points. So they're not really worth points in terms of your final grade, but they're good to keep you on track. Like it, it's always gonna be reviewing the material that we covered in the previous class. So sometimes like on Monday, I'll post the warm up quiz. And again, it'll be like a one point quiz 
that's going to go over the chemistry stuff we've talked about today. You know, and it's so you can check in with yourself. Are you keeping up? And it also kind of gives me a sense if you seem like you're keeping up. So you'll see it appear. Usually it appears like the day before the class and it's due before class starts. So it will be due like at 810 on Tuesday morning. Um, so that that will also start happening. Um, if the appendix said, well, I'm reading, trying to read this. Um, the, the appendix that has a study guide is more for the lecture. The study guide for lab exams is going to be more your lab notebook, actually. Somebody asked about how do you study for the lab exam. We also have lab exam reviews scheduled. Um, and remember, the lab exam is open lab notebook. So keeping a well, well done lab notebook that's clear and lays things out well will be a great help for you when you're actually doing the lab exam since it will be there by your side. So if you're trying to remember like what was the what what did it mean when we dissolved this and we saw that and you go back to your discussion, it's like, oh yeah. Thanks, me. I wrote that up really clearly. I can like answer this question now. Um, um, can I ask a question about the, the also the appendix? Is that what it is? Um, if we don't, if there's stuff on there that we don't cover like in lecture, can we assume that that's? Um, no, we're we're going to cover it all. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the books. So I have the one that I bought versus the one that I rent that you rent from the library. You when you say rent. chapter one, chapter two, are those the same exact chapters in the other book? No, they're not. For instance, like the chemistry stuff in the Sherwood is actually an appendix. So it's definitely different. Um, if you just go into the chapters or the index, you'll find, or if you're, if you're yeah, it should be very easy to find the, the connections. So yeah, I, I changed it all. I could probably even find like an old syllabus that has the Sherwood chapters because that's what I used up to the point when we got the opportunity to use the free textbook. So, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. And if you email me, I can I can do that for you. Um, but again, if if you know what we're covering and you look in the um table of contents that will also lead you pretty directly, I think, to what you're looking for. Um, other questions? Um, um, on, you said, I'm you sorry. You go ahead, Holly. Okay, thank you. Um, on the notebook, you said it's gonna be open notebook. So is that the notebook as in like the brown yes. notebook? So we have to put everything in here and that's the only thing we can use? Correct. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Right, and it won't, you're not supposed to put like crib notes in there. It's supposed to be kind of like your methods, your data, your discussion and things like that. We're still doing the symptom checker before we come to campus every time. Oh, oh, yeah, in fact, I should say that. Yeah, you're supposed to do the symptom checker before you come to campus, which is basically you click on this thing and say, yeah, and hopefully, hopefully nobody is. Hopefully, nobody ends up catching COVID this weekend. Don't go into any crazy things. Um, <laughs> on something, I don't know anything about this. I don't either. I don't know anything about this symptom. Oh, oh, so hold on. I can show it to you. Hold on one second. I just, I just got an email about it. Give me one second here. Um, okay, hold on. Edu. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. All right, so this is just the home page for the Marin website. This is just www.marin.edu. And right here, 
it says symptom screening, complete the symptom screening daily before. So I'm going to click on that. And it says, are you planning to come to campus? Let's say I say yes. Are you an employee, a student or other? Or I'm an employee. And it tells me all oh, blah, 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 blah. And I acknowledge and I hit next. And then I give it my email and I hit next. You know, that would be log on. I'm not going to log on because I'm actually not coming into campus today. But so it's just, it leads you through it from the home page there. So is there, like, is someone going to be checking that we do this or? You like, enter your teacher's email address. You enter your teacher's email address in a different part of this um, tracker and it emails the teacher. And then you get a thing that says you're cleared, right? So I've never had, I've never been on this side of it. So thank you for letting me know that. So yeah, and you'll need to know the room number and your teacher's email and your school email address. So were you in micro? What, what class did you take, Nicole? Oh, I took physiology. I took anatomy and junk all online and ceramics. I go to school every Tuesday, Thursday for ceramics. So I do this constantly ceramics okay um in the room i think you can just put in 114 although i think we'll probably be in 112 um when you actually get to school if we're in 112 i'll just have a big note on the door saying physiology students go next door um and we will start at 8 10 so depending on where you're driving from, you know, you know give yourself time. Um, I know that 101 can be capricious and horrible. Um, you never, you know, you never know what you're gonna get. Um, what else? Um, so for those of us on the wait list, we can show up to class on. Yeah, and we should. Yeah, so send me an email. I'm still trying to figure, I think I might, I have to figure a couple of things out. So send me an email if you're on the wait list and I will give you more of a reality check on what it looks like. Um, and also if, again, if you are enrolled and it looks like and you're you have other irons in the fire or something, you're not sure what's going on, please let me know so that I can have a little more information. It would be very sad if I tell someone they can't be in the class and then like a week later because it does happen people just drop off the map and then it's kind of frustrating so if you if you genuinely are yeah if you know what's going on it's good to let me know um yeah but yeah I would say email me and I'll I'll I'll, I'll get back to you on whether that makes sense or not to come on Tuesday. Um, okay, let me stop sharing this. Um, otherwise, yeah, I am excited. I have not been in a classroom with students for over a year or so. So it'll be it'll probably be weird for everybody. Um, you know, and again, Hopefully, I don't, I've never tried lecturing with a mask on, so hopefully Oops. you can hear me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I will do my best. Um, is the room number, I saw you said it's 112 or 114, but is that, a, I've never been on campus before. Is that in a particular building? Oh yeah, SMN, um, here, let, let's go back. Oh, interesting, I was just kind of, here, let's go back. Um, like College of Marin map. Wait, where, where did it go? This is not Dagnatic. Hold on. Hold on, map. Let's just go with images. It'll be. It's in the. It's like the science nursing building, right? Yeah. S. Oh, oh. 
Like, dag nabbit. Oh, it's because I'm in this stupid, this thing co-opted my search engine and I've got this wrong, this, I don't have the good search. Okay. No wonder. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Marin map, this will work. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, here is Sir Francis Drake. If I let me put on a, a pen. Sir Francis Drake going along this way. College Avenue is there. This math and science and nursing is over here. So there's this little street. This street here is called Laurel. Um, there's a big parking lot actually in the back here um, near the creek where you can easily just walk across and get up into here but it's kind of on this far side of campus. This is if you're coming from the exit to kind of San, from, you know, off of Highway 101 to San Anselmo, you end up on Sir Francis Drake. This is like Bon Air and Marin General is down here. You keep coming down Sir Francis Drake and either go down college and get a parking or come down this way and maybe find parking. And it's on the ground floor of this, they call it, M S M math science nursing. So that is hopefully that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And I don't even know if I think we still are without parking permits, as far as I know. I should double check and let you know. You need a parking permit. You do or don't? You do. You do. Really? Yeah. Only if it's just eight times a semester? It doesn't matter. You can pay each time you want. If it's only $4, you can pay. Or if you get a parking permit, it's only 10 bucks. Oh, okay. Gotcha. It's like half off right now or something like that. Okay. Good to know. Oh, you can order it through your like MyCom and they'll just mail it to you. And they can, they'll email you a temporary one. So until it gets there, you can just print it and oh. put the mine window wow so i need to do that myself i have not had a parking permit for two years um all right was, all right thanks for letting me know that and thanks for letting everybody else know it says it's 21 it's now so weird it went up then still a way better deal than four dollars four times eight which would be 32 yeah um all right, so any other comments, questions? I see on um, on uh, Canvas that there's some activity that's due today, like oh. the second uh, independent and dependent variable worksheet. Oh, sh no, so it's, you know, forget about that. That was, if we had more time, I was going to bring that in as another exercise in independent and dependent variables, but we'll we'll put that a little later. So I will unpublish that and make it less confusing. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, because right, there was, you know, you know, requests to do more exercises, the dependent independent variable. So I want to make sure we do more of that. But I think I think we're kind of cooked for today right now. So all right, so I genuinely look forward to seeing you, meeting you all in person on Tuesday. Uh, make sure you wear your masks. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be safe, but we'll, we'll be, yeah, it'll be so much better than being in Zoom. <laughs>